Welcome to the Sirius Seminar for April 6th. Today, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Endedul Hock, who comes to us from, uh, well, he's currently in a kind of a dual role. He's a, a visiting or a research faculty at Northeastern University, but he is also still in a visiting position at Purdue University. Okay. So, research postdoc. Research postdoc. Yes. So he's actually a postdoctoral position uh, at, at Northeastern while visiting here. Uh, in addition, uh, I should point out that uh, you know, this is something you can all aspire to as he is a graduate of Purdue University receiving his PhD here working with Professor Nita Rotaru, uh, working you know, within Sirius. So, yeah. uh, he, before that, he as she did his un undergraduate work in Bangladesh and then headed to Wisconsin. He was at uh, Marquette for his master's before joining us here at Purdue. So with that, I'll look, turn it over to Endedul to let you know what he is uh, doing. Thank you, to Professor. About today. Thank you, Professor. That's a nice introduction. Can you guys hear me in the back? OK. I'll go ahead. I'll probably try to stand here. That might help me to interact. Uh, OK, thank you for making time for my talk. Today, I'm going to talk about my research, which is about finding specification non-compliance and attacks in wireless network protocol implementations. So let's get started. So with the emergence of uh, new wireless techno uh, technologies like wireless mesh, uh, mobile peer-to-peer, -peer, Internet of Things, being made popular by companies like Cisco and Google is, uh, li is encouraging several efforts in building critical services uh, by leveraging these networks. These critical services include emergency responders, contactless payment, home and industrial automation, so on and so forth. Like traditional wired networks, the core of these uh, wireless networks also consists of several communication protocols. Let me show you the development life cycle of a network protocol. It usually starts with a list of requirements. Then the designer comes up with the protocol design, which, follow, which is followed by the development phase. And once the implementation is ready, it is shipped for deployment. But prior to shipping um, the implementation, it is required that uh, uh, this implementation is checked whether it complies with all the given requirements or not. If it complies with all the requirements, then we can say that this is a compliant implementation and compliant to the given requirements. However, failing to comply with these requirements will result in non-compliance, which can cause functionality loss, inconsistent behavior, interoperability issues, or even security consequences. Now, let me show you an example of real non-compliance in an implementation. So as we all know, like Internet of Things is becoming increasingly popular these days, and various operating systems and SDKs are being developed to program these IoT devices. Contiki is one such operating system. This Internet, uh, these IoT devices still use Telnet protocol for doing communication and remote management. So therefore, Contiki provides a Telnet server implementations. One of the requirements of this implementation is as follows, that the server must handle only one client at a time. Now I'll show you how this implementation violates this requirement. Now consider that client one comes and then connects with the server. It sends some commands to the server and receives the corresponding output. So far, everything is correct. Now assume second client comes and now connects to the server. By accepting this connection, server already violates the requirement. But you can ask that, OK, why is it a big deal? It's just a connection, right? Let, I'll tell you why is it a big deal. Now, in this situation, consider that the client one sends some commands, some new commands to the server. And the server was supposed to send back the output to client one. But in reality, what it does, 
it sends back output to both the clients, even if client two does not did not send the command. So thus, it shows that how it affects the confidentiality of the protocol. And this is an example of a real non-compliance that we have found in the contiguous telnet server implementation. And this shows that implementation needs to be uh, checked for compliances with these specifications prior to deployment. Now next, even if you have an implementation that is compliant with its requirement or with its specification, it can happen that at the presence of an attacker in an adversarial environment, these implementations may lead to some hidden vulnerabilities, which uh, are only, uh, I mean, these vulnerabilities are only, can only manifest in an adversarial environment. Examples include Apple go to fail, which you may have heard about that, OpenSSL heartbleed bug, and so on and so forth. Then these vulnerabilities can cause security consequences, or sometimes they can degrade the expected performance of the protocol, right? So now I'll give you an example of a real example of uh, these uh, of such vulnerabilities. AODV is a routing protocol that was uh, designed for wireless ad hoc networks. In, in, such, in the ad hoc networks, what happens is that the uh, nodes, uh, for their routing purpose, they don't rely on any dedicated routers. Instead, they use themselves, they act as routers to route their own packets. So AODV UU is a specific implementation of that routing protocol. So let's consider we have a network of eight such nodes. Each of them is running this AODV UU implementation. We have the source and the destination, and we have also a compromise node in the network. Now, to transfer data from the source to the destination, the source needs to have a route to the destination. And if it doesn't know the route to the des destination, what it will do, the source will, excuse me, source will broadcast route request message. And the neighboring nodes will receive that route request message. Now, assume that neighboring node N2 does not have any information about the destination. So then it will rebroadcast the route request message. Now once this message will be received by the compromise node, what it can do, it will change the type of the message, for example, to create a malform route request message and rebroadcast it. Now whoever receives this malform message, they will crash while processing this message. And as a result, it will create partitions in the network. And thus, it can affect availability of your network. And this is a real uh, vulnerability that we have found in the uh, AODV UU implementation. Now, such incidents advocate for adversarial testing to ensure the robustness of the implementation prior to their deployment. So that's why in this talk, I'm going to ask about two research questions. The first question is that, can we automatically detect specification non-compliance in protocol implementations so that we can have a more compliant implementations? And second, can we find attacks in, the, the, um, in protocol implementations using automated adversarial testing so that we can have a more robust implementation prior to deployment? Right? Now, let's look at the non-compliance detection. <clears throat> so as I said at the beginning that uh, the protocols are implementation of the protocols are expected to comply with their requirements, which is also known as properties. So these properties uh, specify desired functional requirements of the protocols, and they are usually uh, described in their um, in an in, what is that called informal prose specification. So in, in, uh, in, other, in other words, like you may have seen like some of the RFC standards, like the protocol that are described in RFCs. So those standards, those are pro, uh, quite informal and uh, prose description of the protocols. So now, let me show you an example of such uh, properties. This example is taken from the RFC, uh, Telnet RFC. And you can, as you can see, it's a very prose description of the property. In simple words, what it means that if a node receives a will command, it must 
send uh, uh, com uh, reply with a do or a don't command command so these will and don't are like specific to the telnet protocol whoever knows about the details they will know that what do they mean but i'll not go into the detail about that moreover if uh, implementations that are um, targeted for resource constrained devices like iot devices these implementations uh, are often highly optimized due to the underlying uh, resource constraint of this uh, constraintness of these devices and which may lead to non compliances so our problem statement goes as follows given an event driven network protocol implementation p how can we check whether p violates the given requirements however we do not want to find low level bugs or memory errors in this work right okay now to tackle this problem we have to deal with some challenges for uh, first that network protocols are inherently event driven and uh, but, uh, which involves a lot of complex interactions between its uh, multiple participants second non compliance needs to be checked on the implementation not on their abstract design right so that that means that we have to deal with the low level details and code complexity and third that non compliance can often occur deep in the execution of the network protocol which can uh, uh, um, which can off i mean <clears throat> what do i mean by deep in the execution is like after um, uh, ha a, an intricate sequence of events happens then you may uh, see that uh, uh, some uh, non compliance happened and and there can be an exponential number of arbitrary long sequences <clears throat> so let's take a look at the um, some existing approaches in place to address these problems so <clears throat> there primarily there are two types of uh, approaches to deal with this kind of problem first testing approaches but often times these testing approaches are either uh, i mean manual and they are error prone sometimes they leave of even leave some portion of the uh, protocol some portion of the explore um, uh, code unexplored because of developers inability to um, reason about those cases did i change something here oh, no okay so yeah i'm just saying like you guys cannot see the slide in that so. yeah we 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 got on the display a picture of the room rather than the slides uh we're picking up on the display a picture of the room rather than the slides Mention it to him. Okay. Make sure that you're. Yeah, we still got it up here. Yeah, we have the slides here. I thought that I did something. <laughs> it shouldn't happen. It's just a pointer. Yes, this is a non-compliance. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Okay, I guess I can continue with what or maybe that would be helpful like if you guys could have seen the slides anyway. So, uh, what I was talking that the existing approaches of doing that and then one approach was like uh, testing the implementation and the testing implementation is it is working. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll try to explain. So, uh what I was saying that uh, you can test the implementation that's one um, approach but most of the i mean most of the time these implementations are uh, the testing approaches are manual and error prone and sometimes they leave some portion of the code unexplored because uh, developers inability that they cannot figure out and they did not write those kind of test cases 
that's one approach and the other approach is that involves model checking the implementation what it does that uh, you you model check your implementation uh, and it tries to explore every state of the implementation and see that if your requirements satisfied in all possible uh, uh, all reachable states but all the existing approaches they fall short due to some uh, for, uh, due to some reasons like either some of them i mean I mean, some of them require very restrictive form of properties, while some of them are very language dependent, programming language dependent. And some has, uh, uh, the, uh, some our approaches have, uh, are very imprecise in a sense that because, uh, because of their underlying uh, syntactic approach. So, okay. Maybe I can. Should I wait or continue? I think we have to continue because he's um, okay. Th th yeah, it's, he was trying things and it just it seems to be. Ah, oh, here we go. He's got it back. It's good. Oh, I was trying to. Yep. His... Okay, so yeah, I was talking about the model checking approach, right? So is it? Okay. Okay, for some reason it's working. Ah, the pointer is working now. Okay. So, what we propose that we propose Chiron, an automated framework for compliance, non compliance detection, which is designed for stateful, event driven network protocol implementations. It helps protocol developers to detect uh, mm, the, whether the implementation violates the given properties or not. How, uh, moreover, Chiron does not make any restrictive assumption about the underlying stack or the behavior of other participants of the protocol. We demonstrated Chiron on uh, five different uh, implementation and found 10 instances of non-compliance while checking against 18 protocol properties which uh, these non-compliance have impact uh, or implications on security and interoperability. Now, before I move into the details of Chiron, let me show, our ob uh, let me show you guys our observation on network protocols. Our first observation is <coughs> that protocol operations are often described as finite state machines which uh, the, these finite state machines dictates the internal state of the protocol and it also specifies under which conditions the protocol will make a transition from one state to another. Here you can see an example of, the, uh, of an FSM uh, which of a hypothetical um, protocol. Right. So the second observation is that implementation tends to follow, closely follow the spe specified FSM or the uh, described FSM in the, uh, or the FSM that was described in the specification. Here in this uh, code example, you can see that, that whenever it receives a request, it tries to send a response and change the state. And our third observation is that, this one is not working. Okay, I have to get back here. Okay, our third observation is that non-compliance is often caused by how the implementation is um, implementation handles these network events. For example, in this code, uh, I mean, in this code, uh, code example, you can see that even after receiving an ACK, the implementation is not moving to the ready state. Instead, it was waiting in the waiting state, and that is a non-compliance. Right. Now, let me give you a high-level approach of Chiron. Given a protocol source, Chiron tries to extract the imp FSM that was implemented in the, uh, imp uh, in the source and we get an uh, extracted protocol FSM. Now given the desired properties mm -hmm. which, is a uh, which is derived from the specification, we fed the uh, properties and the extracted FSM into a model checker. What the model checker does, it checks whether the extracted FSM satisfies the given properties. If not, 
that means there is a violation and then it will report the violation now let's take a look at each of the block step by step so let's start with the protocol source so here is an example code showing how an event driven protocol uh, event driven implementation looks like it usually starts with a main that has an event loop uh, or it's usually called an event loop where it stays, sits for uh, and listens for a next event and whenever it listens uh, uh, gets a new event it calls a dispatch function where it tries to call the appropriate handler to handle that appropriate event for example when event x occurs the execution flows from dispatch to handler x similarly for event y execution follows dispatch function and then calls uh, the handle y so typically this kind of implementation also maintains some state variables in this example we are showing that s uh, i mean we are showing a state variable that is s here is an example of a handler how does it look like so oftentimes this handler also change the state of the protocol for example here is showing that s is equal to 2 uh, it's changing from a state 1 to a state 2 so for our analysis we require the source in addition we also require that the name of the state variables in this case s the protocol entry function which is the dispatch function which uh, handles and dispatch all the uh, events and call appropriate handlers and the list of network events okay so let's take a look at the FSM extractor. How does it work? So before that, the question is that, okay, FSM extraction, I mean, it sounds challenging or something or difficult. Let's say, why is it difficult? This example, uh, these two diagrams will tell you why is it difficult. This is a FSM, uh, uh, two FSMs of the same protocol, Telnet, in, the, uh, in this example. The left one is the nicer looking one and very complex, uh, compact FSM. That is a FSM that is derived from the specification. Whereas on the right one, uh, on the right side, you have a FSM that is extracted from an implementation of the Telnet protocol. So as you can see, the number of transition is, uh, I mean, uh, there are a large number of transition uh, we have noticed in the implementation. So therefore, the manually deriving or extracting these FSMs from the implementation is definitely error prone and time consuming. Also extracting FSM with relevant details for analysis it is challenging. So now let's take a look at existing approaches that try to um, extract FSM from the source. The first, uh, uh, but they do fall short in our, uh, in our case because we cannot use them uh, due to following reasons. The approaches that are rely on network traces that are inherently incomplete. And some of them tries to extract only a sequence of messages that are valid in a session rather than the internal protocol FSM that was implemented. And some, uh, some approaches were able to extract FSM out of the source but uh, they are uh, low-level program FSM, not the high-level protocol FSM that we are talking about. So, therefore, we design our own FSM extractor, and here's the key idea of how does it work. I'll go into the details in a bit. The first, we simulate the protocol execution using symbolic execution. Then, during the execution, we collect program state information and constraints along each execution path. And then from there, we extract FSM state and transitions from the collected information. Now, before telling you how does it work, uh, I'll give you a brief intro to uh, about symbolic execution. So, symbolic execution, the, in, in a nutshell, the way it works is that it executes a program on symbolic value rather than concrete values. So I'll give you an example here that you consider this uh, code example where we have main 
in the main function we have two inputs x and y these are symbolic inputs and then they will call the uh, let's say we are executing the code and after uh, x and you will uh, <coughs> then it will call the function with x and y since x and y both are symbolic they don't have any concrete values they have symbolic values in this case let's say we are using a and b that represents it can take any value from its possible um, uh, domain so after executing the first line that is the first statement z becomes twice b now it hits the a conditional branch where it tries to check that whether z and x are equal or not since both of them are symbolic the uh, i mean uh, in the execution engine or the symbolic execution it cannot decide which branch is invisible so it needs to follow both the branch so let's say first it takes the false branch and adds this condition that twice b is not equal to a as a constraint of this path and then if you see the example it returns from the function and also terminates the program and this condition becomes a constraint for that particular execution path of the program right now if required you can solve this constraint to get a concrete values for the input for example in this case we get these two input values for where um, x is 0 y is 1 so now if you use these values the program will always take this execution branch right so that means like each exe execution branch will be represented by their unique path constraint now we had another path that we did not explore yet that is the true branch now you continue with the true branch and next you hit another conditional branch again two of uh, both the branches are possible uh, i mean feasible so the execution needs to follow both the branches and then again you take the false branch and you get the true branch you have different different path constraint for each execution path so one important thing to notice here is that um, e, that uh, in general symbolic executions you need to uh, mark those input variables uh, the program input variables as uh, symbolic so that when it's running it knows that which are the which variables are symbolic and uh, <coughs> now i really wanted to use this one but anyway it's not working properly so I'll, now I'll walk you through an example to explain how our FSM extraction algorithm works. Let's uh, start with, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say we have three network events, T0, T1, T2. And to start the symbolic execution, we will load the program and we, we call this, uh, uh, that's the initial state of the program. We call this program state as, uh, denote the program state as E0. And for clarity, we also call it execution state. Now, in this example, we will e consider that S variable S defines the protocol FSM state variable. Or um, uh, <coughs> so now we can extract the uh, our FSM state from this program uh, execution state, and what we get is F0, where S is equal to zero. If you notice that the this f0 contains only the variable information of s right or s inform uh, information of s so we call them fsm state just for clarity we also maintain a queue where we store the execution state that needs to be explored further for our analysis so since we haven't explored e0 yet we'll just keep it in the queue and start executing from there so now what we do, we will try all the network events on the execution state. So that means that, let's say we trigger T0 on uh, the execution state E0, and it ends up with an execution state E1. So this execution state represents the program state. If you remember from the uh, example that I was showing for event-driven implementation, it is, a, um, it is the program state when the program returns from the dispatch function. Right. So if you have noticed that here, now we can extract the FSM state from out of it, 
and the var variable has changed. The value of the variable has changed from s zero, uh, s equal to zero to now it's s equal to one. Now this is a new FSM state we haven't seen yet. So that's why we add it to our graph and we also add a transition <coughs> from F0, F0 is our current transition from F0 to F1 with a condition that is a combination of the network event and the path constraint from E0 to E1. And also since this F1 is a new stay, FSM state, we will keep the corresponding execution state in our queue so that we can explore it further. Similarly, we'll try the next network event on E0. And let's say it did not change any uh, the uh, value of the state variable. And therefore, we don't get any new state, but we have a new transition, which is essentially a self-loop. Then let's say we try T1, we end up with uh, another execution state where we have a new FSM state because S is equal to two, we will add it to the graph and also add a transition from our current FSM state um, um, with <coughs> to the newly discovered FSM state. And we also keep the execution state in the queue because we need to explore that. And now we are done with all the execution for E0. Now we move on to the next execution state. And then let's uh, start again with T0 on E1. Similar, now consider that we just ended up uh, with a um, execution state where the FSM state is, uh, is old because S equal to two, we already have an FSM state F2, which represents S equal to two. So there is no point of adding a new FSM state there. But we will add a transition from, yeah, from F1 to uh, F2. So this process continues until the entire queue becomes empty. And then the algorithm terminates and returns this extracted FSM as an output. So now, as I show, showed on the high level approach that once we have this FSM uh, extracted FSM, we will feed it to the model checker. So now we need to translate so the extracted FSM so that the model checker can understand. So we do that in two steps. In the first, that we first map atoms of each path constraint to an unique uh, propositional variable. Because model checker don't understand that x greater than zero, what does it mean? It's a model checker expects everything to be Boolean variables. So we uh, map each constraint, uh, each atom to a Boolean variable and store this information for our later use. And in the second step, we convert the extracted FSM to the modeling language that the model checker understands. And th 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 uh, thus we get our uh, translated FSM. Now let's take a look the, at the uh, property verification step. As I said earlier, that properties are disc. Okay. No? It's working. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. As I said earlier, that uh, the properties are uh, described in the specification of the protocol, or you can say the documentation of the protocol. Here is an example of a pro uh, property that is taken from, again taken from the uh, Telnet RFC. Uh, and you can see its prose description. What it means in simple words is that if a node receive two IAC bytes back to back, it must consider the second IAC byte as a regular data. So now in the next step, the, uh, <clears throat> the next step, the developer takes the atom proposition map that we uh, built in the previous step and the extracted FSM and convert this textual property into a property that's PLTL format, right? PLTL is that propositional temporal logic format. Now, in the final step, we feed the translated FSM and this property to the model checker. So the model checker tries to uh, uh, checks that whether the translated FSM satisfies this property. 
if it's satisfied, it will say that the property is valid. If it, uh, if it doesn't satisfy, then it will present a counterexample, which means there is a violation. And these counterexamples imply non-compliance. That means the implementation does not comply with those requirements. Now you can ask, what if these reported counterexamples are false alarm? Yes, these are possible. So therefore, we, uh, um, adopt, uh, uh, we use some validation techniques to rule out such false positives. So before that, what is a counterexample? A counterexample is a trace of the FSM that falsifies the property. Right? Here is a sample example. So we want to ask the question that, OK, it's good that model checker gave, gave us some uh, um, counterexamples. How can we make sure that this counterexample actually exists in the code? Uh, so to do that, we use two-step validation process, where in the first step, we first ask that whether the reported counterexample is spurious or not. If it is a spurious counterexample, we will guide the model checker uh, so that it will not report the same spurious counter checker in future. And uh, in the other case where it is not a spurious counter uh, example, we uh, go, uh, move it to the next step. And that is where we essentially concretely execute the counter example to see that if it is actual, uh, if, it, if the counter example is realizable in an actual uh, execution of the in protocol implementations. If so, only then we report the counter example as a non-compliance. I will, uh, I mean, due to time limitation, I will not go to the details of these uh, validation steps. So I'll just move on to that our optimization. So what we notice that uh, we can optimize our FSM extraction algorithm a little bit further. So if you remember in uh, in our algorithm, we were trying all network events in each of the execution states. So we realized that some of the sequence of network events that we were trying were not feasible. For example, in case of TCP, uh, receiving, uh, I mean, uh, having a receive event before a connection event is not meaningful. You first have to establish a connection, then you can receive some packets, right? So therefore, and uh, we also observe that these infeasible network or order of network events can lead to many spurious transitions. So, so, so we allow developers to specify um, the feasible order of network events, like the protocol implement. Uh, uh, let's say the protocol is implemented on top of TCP or UDP. The developer can specify that okay, this is the feasible order. So I'll show you an example here. Like let's consider this example. It says that. At the beginning, you have that uh, um, only connection is possible. Once you get a connection, then you can receive new packets or even an event that will close the connection. So this is a sample event model. And this is the one that is the event model for, uh, of TCP uh, from the implementation of uh, Contiki OS. Right? OK. <clears throat> So we implemented Chiron. Uh, the FSM extractor was implemented on top of the CLI symbolic execution engine, which is an open source uh, engine. And we added additional 4,000 lines of code for uh, our extractor. Uh, we also implemented uh, the translator. Since we are, uh, um, I mean, we are using a new SMV model checker, we, uh, our translator can um, produce or translate the extracted FSM for that modeling language. And uh, for spurious counterexample checker, we also build uh, a tool on using some of the key libraries. So for evaluation, we applied uh, Chiron on five different implementations of um, two protocols. And we found 10 instances of non-compliance while we were checking against uh, 11, uh, 18 properties, 11 for Telnet and 7 for DHCP. This result shows the impact of uh, our optimizations. The restricted event model means that uh, the, um, the event model where it only considers feasible order of events, whereas the non-restricted event model is that it considers infeasible or feasible order. It considers uh, all possible event, order of events. As you can see, there are a lot of transitions in non-restricted event models, and these are all 
spurious transitions. So now, now that we have talked about the non-compliance discovery uh, detection, let's uh, shift gears and then talk about the attack discovery. So routing is a fundamental component to enable multi-hub communication in wireless mesh networks. There are a lot of examples of routing protocols which are actually implemented and deployed in real life. And we have seen at the beginning that uh, vulnerabilities often manifest in adversarial environments. Then the question is how to ensure the robustness of wireless routing protocol implementations prior uh, to these attacks prior to deployment. In this work, we consider an attack model which is as follows. That we consider the attackers are insiders who do not play by the rules of the protocol. They manipulate protocol messages to impair performance and uh, as a result it can lead to performance attacks. There are very, uh, various malicious actions can be taken by these attackers. For example, they can disrupt the delivery or modify the content of the messages or they can even take some actions that are pretty specific to wireless routing, for example, replay and black hole. We ad uh, advocate for adversarial testing, what means that testing implementation beyond, beyond their basic capabilities or basic functionalities. Uh, um, to do so, we, uh, we advocate for examining edge cases, boundary conditions, and conduct, uh, conduct testing using malicious actions. There are some prior works who used automated adversarial testing, but they, uh, they fall short for various reasons, including they have uh, some of them has like language, programming language dependency, whereas some were very uh, very uh, were targeted for very specific types of protocols and mostly wired uh, protocols. Our protocols were designed for wired networks. So now the question becomes that. How can we perform automated adversarial testing on unmodified implementations of wireless routing protocols? So the next question is that uh, obviously comes like now that we want to test, what would be our testing environment? One option is that we can use the real deployed network. In that case, uh, the, uh, there are some benefits of that because we can run the actual implementation on real hardware. hardware we don't have to modify the implementation and we can communicate using real radio medium and another option is that we can use simulators where we simulate both the nodes and the network it is simple and easy way that you can do various under various condition you can uh, test uh, different types of correctness or uh, and a uh, performance now are these net environments suitable for our goal actually not and because of their limitations for if we use real deployed networks, then the testing will interfere with the user experience. And since it is a real deployed network, we won't be able to reproduce uh, or uh, the uh, what uh, the network events that happen. Or in some sense, even if we can, it may not match the exact uh, scenario. Then, in case of simulators, oftentimes simulators require an imp implementation which is different from the implementation that will be deployed in real world. And since uh, these uh, implementations are, uh, uh, ran, uh, <coughs> are run in a simulator, they, these uh, uh, they cannot uh, f uh, capture the interaction with the operating system components. So therefore, we propose TurretW, a platform for um, automated adversarial testing of wireless routing protocols. It allows us to test actual implementation of the protocols by leveraging virtualization and network emulation. We tested five routing protocols with turret and found several attacks and bugs. At a high level, turretw works as follows. That given an unmodified target code, in this case the a routing implementation, it deploys this uh, code in each of the VMs. For communication, it utilizes uh, 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 emulated wireless network. Now with the help of the routing protocol, the VM will start communicating with each other. At some point, a malicious component that injects some malicious actions into the network. And at the end of the execution, 
the platform uh, measures the performance and labels that whether the injected malicious action result in, in a successful attack or not. So we use virtualization because it, uh, it provides us the, uh, some benefits and that is uh, it allows us to run unmodified code, the same code that will be run on the deployed version uh, on, on in your deployment and added to that you can even use the same OS and the libraries that you will use for the deployment. It allows us to capture and therefore it allows us to capture the interaction between the code and its native environment. And uh, it also removes any restriction specific towards a particular OS or uh, some uh, programming languages. On the other hand, wireless network emulation provides a realistic network where, uh, which has a capability of reproducing network events. <clears throat> so now the question you can ask like, okay, how, how are we generating different types of attacks? So our approach is based on first testing, which is uh, shown to be a very effective black box testing. What it does that it randomly mutates uh, some well-formed inputs to create various test cases and then um, um, test the given program on these test cases. But it provides very limited coverage of the large search space. So therefore, to reduce the search, a large search space, we uh, adopt some uh, measures here. For example, instead of modifying the content of the message or mutating at a, uh, at a random position uh, in the message, we try to identify the fields of the protocol messages and then muted them. We also consider that the message fields are independent and we apply some general mutation techniques um, as proposed in like previous works. Um, for example, if it is a numeric field, we can, you can set a min or maximum allowed value uh, for that particular data type or you can set zero or negative numbers and so on and so forth. But to do uh, so, what we require from the user that the required needs to provide the format of each uh, protocol message. So instead of going through the details of my, uh, my evolution, I'll just provide a summary of the discovered attacks. So <clears throat> we applied, um, uh, we tested five different implementations on, um, uh, uh, with turret W and found several attacks and bugs where uh, some of them were not previously reported. Okay. So now to wrap up my talk, I would like to go back to the research questions that I asked at the beginning of the uh, talk. So to answer the first question, we developed Chiron for automatic, uh, automatically detecting non-compliance in protocol implementation. We applied it on five, uh, impl uh, five protocol implementations and found 10 instances of non-compliance. And to answer the second questions, we developed Turret W for automated adversarial testing of wireless routing protocol implementations. And we tested five implementations using this platform and found several attacks and bugs. So now I want to thank, thank my uh, collaborators and advisors and thank you all for listening to my talk. I'll be, if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer your questions. As you look at the Internet of Things, networking protocols, um, you had, I think, 18 different mm -hmm. specifications you look for compliance. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that some of these subnetworks would have a requirement that requires less of those specifications to function and then they're isolated from the rest of the world and therefore should be tested under different standards or what are your thoughts? <clears throat> okay, that's a good question. Uh, good question is, so one thing is that we, uh, as you say that you may have, I mean, okay, specification come from different places. It can come from standards or it can come from your, um, when you are implementing, you may have uh, some uh, uh, requirements. For example, the requirements that I showed at the beginning, 
that uh, um, the server, Telnet server needs to talk to only one client that actually came from their implementation because they wanted to have a uh, highly optimized implementation. Right. So in our, uh, the, the properties that we tested that uh, came from several places, some of them from the RFC standards, some of them from the documentation, code documentation, and some came from bug reports. So we tried to see that, okay, whether it's uh, actually happened or not. So yes, you can, uh, in those cases, like uh, uh, if you have a specific requirements that are very, uh, I mean, your implementation dependent, so you can try it out and it's definitely required. Not only having, uh, um, I mean, uh, properties coming from standards, your implementation may have some different requirements. Yeah. Yes. In your uh, protocol implementation checking table, uh, you noted that you had five uh, non-compliances in Contiki 2.4 and four in 2.7. Mm -hmm. Did those overlap? Uh, yes, some of them. Some of them was there and that overlap. And that, uh, I guess, yes, a few, two of them is still in, yes. 2.4 and still in 2.7, yeah. If, if, you're, if you're looking at, for example, like a smart home, Internet of Things, mm -hmm. security, I mean, there's some things a consumer can do, um, some things utilities can do, you know, like let's say Comcast, mm -hmm. Xfinity is selling it to a homeowner. Um, is there anyone out there that looks at these different devices that are trying to plug and play with each other from various vendors and says, okay, you know, baseline security, you're mm -hmm. in compliance, mm -hmm. or baseline yeah. security, you're just out of the ranch, you know, and no matter what the consumer does, you're unprotected. Is there anyone looking at it from that direction other than, say, research like you would do? That's another good question. I don't think so. People say that it comes with like basic security or something that you go Best Buy or Walmart or uh, Radio Shack, you buy those two, I mean, devices. You don't even know what are there, I mean, inside. I mean, and that's why like a lot of, if you see like cyber security in cases, a lot of, um, I mean, hacking is, I mean, is, uh, I mean in some conferences uh, like DEF CON or hacking conferences, they're showing that this is possible. They can like break into your system, I mean, that you are using in your home these IoT devices and they don't have enough security in, in some of the cases. I'll ask one more question. I'll sure. <laughs> um, do you see a trend where vendors kind of hide what they're doing for security to obfuscate and make any attacker's job more difficult? Or are they kind of saying, this is what we implement, therefore if you're trying to engineer a total solution with various vendors, this is how it'll work well or maybe not so well? So you're saying that um, your question is that whether people are doing um, any kind so, of... So let's say we're company X and we're selling a mm -hmm. new product for an internet at home or maybe a SCADA application. Mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, Internet of Things for a smart home or SCADA. Are vendors advertising that we're secure because we use AES and we use, you know, TLS, yes, yes. whatever the okay. latest version mm -hmm. is? Mm -hmm. Or are they kind of basically keeping that close hold just to make the attacker's job more difficult when their products are implemented in the field. Can you tell is, is there a trend at all? And it may be unfair question, okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly that what the user's trend right now, but I would say like the, um, I mean, it's getting into the radar that well, these uh, IoT devices are not enough secure. And it requires like more and more attention from the research world and also definitely from the industry, right? I mean, uh, I mean, whether and there might be definitely some cost benefit issues there, right? But the, it's uh, users uh, security is involved there. So definitely, I mean, they are getting attention, but I wouldn't say that I mean, it's completely secure right now. So, any more questions? Yes. Hi. Um, you talked about uh, checking the robustness of network protocols, mm -hmm. uh, considering inside attackers. Mm -hmm. Do you see this research extending to um, automatically detect 
that uh, possible vulnerabilities towards outside attackers like eavesdroppers or something? Mm. Okay. So one thing is that in this case, like, yeah, we are specific, like, we're not considering outside attackers. And for that, like, you do have, like, there are a lot of people, uh, I mean, there are a lot of uh, network security techniques that applies, like doing encryption and doing other stuff. But in this case, we what we are trying to say that after getting one of the nodes compromised, and they know, I mean, they know the protocol, and they know they have, I mean, they have the encryption keys, and they are using it. What bad they can do, right? Under, uh, underneath the, uh, even if your messages are encrypted, but the values or the, uh, the content of the message, by changing those messages, what bad they can do. So yes, it's mostly uh, looking the problem from a different perspective rather than from outsider. And um, also, like there are uh, existing other researchers, uh, other research works that look at like um, uh, trying to uh, defend against outside work, uh, outside attackers, outsiders, not the insiders. So we are from the insider perspective. Anything else? Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Hobb. Thank you. See you all next week. The following week is a serious symposium.